So, I mean, just take sickness absence levels. They're pretty high in the public sector, aren't they? Maybe a bit less high, a bit higher than the uh, the private sector. But there's a real business imperative uh, to get those levels down and enable people to be more productive. They're not productive if they're away sick. Yeah. Can I say about the figures on sickness absence in the public sector? I mean, I think the public sector get a lot of uh, poor PR on this, uh, like, you know, people are whinging and, in, you know, they want to take a day off they can in the, in the civil service or the public sector, and that's why they have, you know, that because it's so secure, people don't care. I think that the levels of sickness absence in the private sector are underreported in the sense that people are frightened of taking as many days off ill even when they are really ill and legitimately ill uh, because they could be vulnerable to the sack. So I suspect that there is a difference if you look at all the figures the public sector are substan have substantially higher sickness absence than the private sector. I suspect they're, they're roughly about the same. But they're both still too high, which is the problem. I'm concerned not just about reducing sickness absence in the public sector, because I think we do have a problem. We have it in the national health system, DWP, we have it in, in the private sector as well, and we have to manage people a lot better. But stress management isn't just about getting sickness absence rates down. Stress management should be about creating environments where people are more motivated, where their performance and productivity will improve. So my own view is when you're, when you're talking about stress management, you're not just talking about making people healthier, you're talking about making businesses yeah. healthier, yeah. more productive, uh, better performance, more committed people and more motivated people. And that's what I think you'll get when you're trying to manage the pressures on people. And ironically, really, some of our strategies for improving productivity may increase sickness absence um, and increase the um, inefficiency of the organization rather than having the desired effect. Yeah, it, so it's a, a kind it, of double whammy there. Yeah, there's That's, an interesting issue here, which mm. is we're kind of performance managing people mm. rather than trying to get at the essence or underneath what's really the demo demotivator for them. That's what we have to we have to look at the drivers of why people aren't motivated, engaged. Uh, and I think if we got at the drivers rather than trying to micromanage and do absence management, for example, or forcing them to be more productive, we have to get at what underpins why they're not. And I think it's about engagement, getting them involved in decision making, giving them some ownership. And in the public services in particular, and in the civil service in particular, I think we have a problem about being risk averse. I think what a lot of people are frightened of is actually taking decisions because if they take decisions and it goes wrong, you know, we're talking about a, a, a fault culture and we don't, and that's what I think worries them. It's a kind of fear of making a decision uh, and we don't need blame cultures. What we need in the civil service and the public sector generally is, is to engage people to allow them to take risks and when they make decisions that go wrong, you know, not to create a blame culture and that's the end of their career, but, you know, that it's a learning experience to make mistakes. If you don't, I think one of the problems we have is that people will not take risks. You won't get the kind of decisive management decisions. You won't get the performance that we're all looking for in terms of the delivery of the public services. That's great. Just go back to um, the uh, point you made about the sort of work-life interface and um, no, by implication, really, when you talked about uh, two-thirds of families having either two earning parents or only one parent, um, you know, there are a lot of government policies on criminal justice, on citizenship, um, and uh, you know, those areas of social policy that require better parenting of us. Um, but actually, we're not there at home parenting. We're in the workplace stacking up the hours, from what yeah. you're saying. What's your... What's your comment on the interconnectedness mm -hmm. of those things? You're right to say that I think one of the big issues we have as a society, this is not just the public sector, it's the private sector as well, is the fact that if two out of every three couples are working couples or single parent working people, then the difficulty we have, and we have very long hours, the difficulty we have is how do we juggle it all? Mm -hmm. And it isn't an irony that we have all this great new technology, right? Mm -hmm. And we still come in 7.30 in the morning then turn on our computer, do our emails in, serv in a service-based economy like we currently are. Isn't it silly that 
are, shouldn't we have much more flexible working arrangements? I must say that the civil service and the public sector tend to be better than the private sector on this in terms of slightly more flexible working arrangements, maybe not as flexible as it could be. Why aren't we using new technology to our advantage so that people can, instead of having a coffee break and spending a half an hour with your colleagues talking about a football match or some other kind of subject in the middle of the day, you go pick up your child from school? And why shouldn't we have both parents doing that, not just women using it? If you look at the flexible working arrangements arena, it's still primarily women who take it up when it's being offered. But I don't think we truly have a good menu of flexible working arrangements. We have, you know, that people still feel that they have to come in, into Mother Earth. They have to come into the center, uh, you know, into London, the Birmingham and Manchester and, and the big urban areas, basically. And they work kind of around, there's some flexibility, but not enough. I think we need more of that, using new technology to our advantage. But that's, again, about trust. It's about trusting people to make mistakes. It's about trusting people that when they're working from home that they will actually do their job. And most people don't want to work exclusively from home because they like the social contact with their colleagues. I mean, we go to work partly to talk about football and get counseling about our wayward kids and their binge drinking. We do that because that's part of the human condition. But I think we need to work a lot more flexibly and trust people to do that. Give them give them the objectives that they have to achieve and then trust them to figure out the scheduling and, and the where and the how to deliver. So what you paint a, a really complex picture of you know, a rate of change of people locked into patterns of behaviour that are not good for them, not good for uh, productivity and achievement of public purpose and certainly not good for family and community life. So we've got a pretty serious problem which you've put firmly on the agenda, I think. What would be your, you know, what would be your key um, suggestions to government departments as to, as to where they ought to take this? I think my key suggestion would be, and when I really look at it all, when I look at the issues of people feeling they don't have control, coping with change, trying to juggle family and life and work life, uh, and having some kind of flexibility and be, being bottom line managed, much more autocratically managed, I think the critical dimension, if you look at all of those areas where the evidence is clear what the factors are, we don't need any more stress research. There are 20,000 studies out there. We know now conclusively from evidence what the factors are that cause people ill health in the workplace. The critical dimension is the manager, whether it's the public sector or the private sector. The critical person in this, in this scenario is because a good, effective manager is somebody who is aware of their, of their subordinates, aware that the subordinates are, in, that they should be engaged in decision making, aware that they're overloaded, aware that they have problems outside that they need to juggle more and work a bit more flexibly. I think the critical dimension is the training of our managers in the public sector to make sure that they're aware of the human factor. We often hear from HR people, you know, the most valuable resource we have is our human resource. Rather than mouth it, we need more action on that. We need the training of people in managerial roles, roles to understand the factors that cause people trouble. A very effective manager will have very little stress among their employees. Mm. So big lessons for there, there for us at the National School is the Government Centre for Excellence in, um, in, in development, learning and development. We, yeah. there's, a, there's an agenda there for us to pick up, I think. Yeah, I think if you look at the National School, I think Gus O'Donnell's right. I think he thinks it's all about leadership and management and, and, and having those kind of people skills. And those people skills are critical, not just for reducing illness and getting rid of stress. It is about increasing performance, productivity, and engagement. It's critical for that, and commitment. And I think that's what the National School's agenda should be. It's all about developing the person to understand the people that they're involved in, uh, you know, need them to be aware of all those kinds of dimensions. Kerry, Kerry Cooper, thank you very much for uh, this discussion and thank you. Uh, all your contribution uh, to the National School of Sunningdale Institute and to the whole field of workplace stress and alleviating it. Thank you very much, Sue. I've enjoyed it. Good.